Hi, and welcome to this lesson on using clocks in reactions. In the previous session, we looked at how to determine the order of reactions experimentally. Here, we're going to be having a look mostly at the iodine clock experiment. The clock experiment, it's ultimately just a simplified version of the traditional initial rates method used to determine the orders that we looked at in the previous uh, session. But it involves measuring the time taken. So hence there's a clock. So we're measuring the time taken for a particular amount of product. And a particular amount is quite sensitive to be produced by a chemical reaction for a different or at different reactant concentrations. So you end up running a few experiments at different concentrations and plotting those results. An observable endpoint must be used to determine when the required amount of product has been made and therefore when to stop the timer. Because we can see that product concentration will suddenly increase when the limiting reactant is used up. When carrying out a clock experiment, there are some assumptions that we're going to make. We're going to assume that the change in reactant concentrations is insignificant, also that the temperature does not change, and that the end point is reached before the reaction has gone too far. So we have step one of the iodine clock experiment. So what do we need to mix together to create our experiment? We are going to have sulfuric acid. That gives us some protons. And then we're going to have some potassium iodide. And that's going to give us some iron, iron ions, some iron ions. And then we are going to be able to form iodine from that. So if I put that together in an equation, oh, and of course, we've got hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. So all of these together, we have H2O2, my hydrogen peroxide, plus the iodine ions. These are all going to be aqueous, of course, plus my protons that have come from the sulfuric acid. And that's going to give us two H2O, so two moles of water, and iodine. And iodine, when it's in an aqueous condition, it's got that very, very distinctive colour. Step two of the iodine clock experiment is the addition of starch solution. So that solution is going to act as an indicator. It's going to tell us that there's iodine present. It goes from brown, because of course iodine solution, aqueous iodine is brown. When starch is added, it reacts with the, and detects the iodine, and it turns dark blue. So it's really important you remember that colour change. Step three is the addition of sodium thiosulfate. So the thiosulfate ions initially react with the iodine. And that causes the reaction to turn colourless. And we can show this as an equation. So we've got two moles of S2O3, two minus, our thiosulfate ions, and that's going to be aqueous, plus my iodine that it's reacting with, and again, that's aqueous, is going to give us two moles of iodine ions, or iodide ions, and S4O6, two minus aqueous and that is colourless and that's when we start the timer. So we started the timer, when do we stop it? Well step four of the iodine clock reaction is when the end point is reached. So how do we know when we've reached the end point? So as the thiosulfate ions get used up the iodine stays in the solution and that causes it to start turning blue again because it was blue before and it starts turning blue again and then we're going to stop the timer when we see this happen so we're going from colorless to blue or back to blue and of course the final step oh and then you're going to stop the timer when you see that happen and the final step is to repeat all of the above but with different concentrations of the potassium iodide or hydrogen peroxide 